amount of Bitcoin being transferred on, a, and you can watch that in real time. You just go to fiatleak.com. It's pretty much most of the Bitcoin is going to China right now, and it's been that way for quite a while. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, it's been uh, one of the driving factors in the price of Bitcoin for the for the last while, uh, and uh, the main reason is because China, of course, has been doing quite well over the last uh, decade or two because they've uh, become quite capitalist. In fact, in many ways, they're much more capitalist than the U.S. now, as the U.S. is so socialist and almost communist now in many ways. Uh, so uh, they've been booming. A lot of people that's been generating massive amounts of wealth, as it does every single time you allow the free market or or what true capitalism. Or or, or free free trade actually actual true free trade if you allow that to happen you'll just have people doing incredibly well that's happened every single time in human history uh, uh, but still to this point people still haven't figured it out uh, but uh, because of that a lot of people in China are making a lot of money over the last few decades a lot of billionaires being created a lot of millionaires and uh, but China still has capital controls on the Chinese one I, I believe it's uh, every Chinese citizen or subject is allowed to um, take fifty thousand dollars worth of uh, yuan every Every year outside of China. I think that's roughly the amount they're allowed. Uh, so you actually see every year, right at the start of the year, a lot of people take it out right away. Uh, and so that's why uh, I think we saw Bitcoin really spike in the first few days of January, as I think a lot of people just started moving a lot of money around at that point. And of course, Bitcoin's the easiest way to move money anywhere in the world uh, today, and the cheapest. Uh, it's just the best in every in every possible way, and it can't be stopped to, uh, due to the capital controls. You just can't stop Bitcoin, uh, which is another reason that people love it. So yeah, we've seen a, a lot of people in China just uh, take on to it. And of course, the Chinese also have a, a bit of a, uh, I hate generalizing about a, a vast amount of people, but a billion people. But in general, the culture seems to be more open to things like risk taking and, and gambling to some extent. And so you're seeing a lot of traders getting on to Bitcoin and just trading it in China. You see so much trading going on there. And um, and so that's, I think, uh, one of the main reasons Bitcoin has is, is really uh, been uh, doing quite well recently. And of course, we're seeing Bitcoin expanding all over the place, but there's, there hasn't been one uh, particular place like, quite like China. Now, in what ways is uh, the Chinese government um, in the it, so what way is China kind of pushing back against Bitcoin? Because I know you said that uh, some of the Bitcoin with withdrawals in China were actually suspended, are suspended right now. Can you expand on this? Yeah, it's been an ongoing sort of a struggle uh, of the Chinese government and the Bank of China to kind of slow down this adopting, uh, 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 people adopting Bitcoin. Uh, this has been going on for years. Uh, it was a few years ago, I believe, that uh, they tried to shut down a number of Bitcoin exchanges. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard on numerous occasions that chi uh, China is making uh, Bitcoin exchanges illegal and stuff like that. But the great thing about China is a lot of people there just don't care what the government says. They're much more freedom-minded than people in the U.S. Uh, they're... Uh, uh, and they just don't care. Uh, they're not slaves like a lot of people in the West today who whatever government says something, they just bow down to it like it's something, uh, you know, they can never stand up to or something like a bunch of slaves. But in China, they, they really, uh, a lot of people, they just don't care. Uh, there's even an entire city in China where they don't have a government. There's no real government involvement in anything, and they won't even allow the government uh, to be there, which is great. Uh, and it's it's been booming, of course. That's exactly what you would expect. Uh, so that's what's been going on is they're, they've been trying to shut it down because they're realizing that they're there it's really a a lot of people are starting to move a lot of their assets outside of China uh, using Bitcoin, but they, they really can't uh, stop it completely. It's just too many people. There's too many things. The government isn't quite as uh, big and massive as it is in the U.S. at this point, so it really can't just stop it. And there's absolutely no way to stop it except for using guns and going to offices and saying, if you do this, we're going to throw you, kidnap you and throw you in a cage, which is all government does in anyway. Uh, so uh, that's what's been going on. But most recently, last week, uh, the, the Central Bank of China uh, cracked down on a number of Bitcoin exchanges and said they're worried about money laundering. And of course, money laundering isn't uh, something that's uh, a criminal act by any means. It's actually avoiding a criminal act of taxation, which is just theft. So people trying to avoid being extorted by the government try to uh, put their money all over the place. They call it money laundering. Uh, and so the, the Bank of China said, we're, we're worried about your money laundering. People might be laundering money through here. So uh, they somehow got a few of the exchanges to, to stop uh, Bitcoin withdrawals for 
one month until they could get some of their uh, uh, anti-money laundering information on people. So they're basically trying to find out more information on their customers and things like that, which is what's been going on in the U.S. The U.S. already did that with uh, Coinbase. Uh, so it's interesting. There's a few exchanges that are still operating. You can still withdraw your Bitcoin, but there's a few right now that so you can't withdraw your Bitcoin at the moment. So that's going to be interesting because uh, essentially all that Bitcoin is, is frozen at this moment in time. And we'll see what happens if they do lift that ban, which is say it will be a month, which, you know, you can never trust the government. It could be forever, really. Uh, but uh, if it's uh, actually let loose in a month, that will be interesting. It'll be a time to watch for Bitcoin just, just to see what people do, whether they buy more or if they just start selling because they're worried that this might happen again in the future. Now, what about in the U.S.? Has there been pushback by the American government uh, against Bitcoin? And what do you see Trump doing, if anything, about Bitcoin? Yeah, the U.S. has been interesting. It hasn't been too uh, bad. In many ways, it's been uh, Bitcoin has been allowed to operate. Of course, when the U.S. government first found out about it, uh, that was about 2013. Uh, there was the first Bitcoin conference ever was held in San Jose, California, and the federal government went in and shut it down and actually put people in jail just for going to the conference. So typical government, uh, when they find out about something they don't like that might threaten their monopoly on on violence and uh, a monopoly on banking and central banking and stuff like that, they just went and shut it down but uh, uh, there's been a lot of Bitcoin activity there's a lot of uh, Bitcoin related companies in the US now uh, of course a lot of Bitcoins related to technology and a lot of Silicon Valley is in the US uh, so a lot of the uh, activity is there so they haven't really shut it down too much there's been areas like for example New York State which is one of the most fascist uh, uh, out of control uh, anti-freedom places in the world uh, they actually uh, institute something called a bit license uh, that essentially made it so they put in so many rules and regulations on it uh, that it's almost impossible to operate as a Bitcoin related company in New York State now. So they basically shut it down that way. That's sort of like a backdoor way to try to slow down the growth of Bitcoin. Uh, but in general, uh, you can still operate and you can still trade Bitcoin in the U.S. Uh, they're even trying to bring in a Bitcoin ETF now, uh, which if uh, if that actually gets approved by the SEC, and of course the SEC is just another criminal government organization, but if they do allow it, uh, that will actually increase the uh, the value of Bitcoin, in my opinion, uh, dramatically. Uh, not even 100% or 200%, but much more, uh, because it will make it so much easier for people to actually get exposure to the portfolio in Bitcoin. Uh, so it's going to be interesting, but th these governments change all the time. That's the thing. You can never trust uh, the government. So, you know, all it takes is one guy getting a payoff from somebody, and, and then uh, he institutes a law and, and stuff like that. But as of right now, uh, Bitcoin is uh, not being cracked down very much on in the U.S., uh, and uh, so that's good. Every country is different, as I pointed out. I think Bitcoin's illegal in Thailand right now. Uh, I think it's illegal in Venezuela. Uh, it's a lot of the places where they have the worst sort of capital controls issues where they really try to crack down on it. Now, looking at the Bitcoin charts, um, Bitcoin is actually close to its all-time high. It's right now around 1,000, and its all-time high, it looks like it was um, a little below 1,200. So what is your perspective on where Bitcoin is heading in the future? Because I think you've talked about this before, and you think that Bitcoin is headed much higher. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, if the if this ETF can get approved by the SEC, it will go exponentially higher, uh, not immediately, but over the next couple of years, uh, because the main issue with Bitcoin is that a lot of people still don't understand it. A lot of people are starting to catch on that they should probably start using it. They should uh, have some exposure to it. Uh, but it's it's not super simple still to understand Bitcoin. And of course, most people have gone to government indoctrination camps for 12 years and so that's where they got edumacated and they don't really have they're not really capable of thinking very well anymore so it's really hard for people to even understand uh, how to use bitcoin but of course an etf would just make it easy it'd be like buying a stock on a stock exchange which a lot of americans are used to or or know how to do that or even their money managers or their mutual fund manager whoever could then buy it uh, so that will be interesting of course the adoption of bitcoin just continues to expand the usage of bitcoin just continues to rise so that's that's really what uh, it takes for bitcoin to continue to go up in price. It's all supply and demand. Uh, the more that people want Bitcoin, uh, the more it will rise in price. It's just simple supply and demand. Uh, the, the negatives for Bitcoin that could hurt it is it's getting so used now uh, uh, that it's having actually a hard time keeping up with the growth. And uh, the people, the, the developers who are trying to develop Bitcoin have been slow to adopt uh, new practices to increase the speed of Bitcoin. So we've seen some delays over the last uh, year or so of people transferring Bitcoin, the Bitcoin mining fees, which are the, the, the cost, it will, it will, uh, the price will cost you to transfer 
uh, is has been rising. You're seeing like an average price now for a transfer of nearly a dollar, which is up massively for Bitcoin. Uh, it's still absolutely nothing compared to PayPal or banks, uh, bank wire transfer, anything like that, especially if you're transferring large amounts of money. It's absolutely nothing. But uh, it is still, uh, these are concerns. So there's issues. Bitcoin's only eight years old uh, as of right now. Uh, so it is a new technology. It's lots of things that could happen. We could see all this government stuff happening as well. So it's a, it's a big sort of, you know, you look at the risk and you look at the reward. But in my opinion, the reward side way out, outweighs the risk side at this moment in time. All right. Well, I'd like to move our focus now to the, you know, a Trump presidency. And we've Trump has been in office for the first uh, for a couple or for a few weeks now. What is your perspective on the first few weeks um, that he's been in office? Uh, it's been pretty much exactly what I expected. I actually predicted he would get elected. I, I could see he had the backing of the uh, global elites. Uh, he's not an outsider by any means. Absolutely not. He's an old friend of the Clintons. Uh, what was one of the things that he said before he got elected that he was going to put Hillary Clinton in jail? Uh, and then as soon as he got elected, uh, he started saying, oh, no, they're good friends of mine. We've been friends for decades. I golf with Bill all the time. I would never put them in jail. You know, it's all yeah, typical uh, politicians talk. This has happened for centuries. I don't I don't know why people never figure it out. I, this whole system is just a big rig system. You're never going to uh, get what you know true freedom out of the system, even if that's what people even wanted. I don't know if, even know if people want that anymore. Uh, but uh, as far as what he's done so far, uh, some of the people will say some of the good thing he's, things he's done, and I would agree with them, is he's sort of scrapped the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a totally anti-freedom, anti-free trade deal, uh, very massive fascist sort of a trade deal. Uh, but that deal was actually already dead in the water. There was, it was not going anywhere. It was not being agreed to by anyone. So uh, that was already dead. And then the other sort of big thing that a lot of people have said that he's done uh, good is sort of... Uh, uh, fought back against this global warming hoax, and it is a total hoax. It's, it's absolutely just a m major hoax to put in a massive tax on people on the air that they actually breathe out of their mouth, CO2. Uh, it's actually cr insane, uh, the whole thing, and all the lies they've told about global warming. We're seeing, you know, Al Gore said by this uh, by this year there would be no snow. <laughs> uh, there's people in the northeast of the U.S. under about eight feet of snow right now. It's just a total scam. Uh, but that's another case where if you looked at the, uh, at the numbers of the polls, people didn't care at all about global warming. It was not going anywhere. No one wanted to see any major legislation put in about global warming. I think it was like 2% of Americans thought it was important. Uh, so that was another one that was already dead in the water. So I think they kind of put him out there to say, oh, look, I killed those things, you know, so I am really a freedom fighter. I am getting rid of all these major fascists and then this huge globalist elites, uh, the central bankers and all that. But he's not. Uh, he's talked about maybe auditing the Fed, uh, but you don't really need to audit the Fed. We know exactly what it does. What you need is to shut it down immediately. Uh, but he would never do that. There's no chance of that. Um, he's definitely not closing down the IRS, the biggest extortion racket in the U.S., which extorts uh, many Americans for half the money they make every year. There's no talk about that. So there's no freedom aspect to him at all. He just He's actually uh, uh, raising the wars. A uh, few of the things he talked about before he got in was how he's going to get rid of a lot of these wars that Nobel Peace Prize winner Barack Obama had uh, started and been involved in all over the world. And he's just increased them. Uh, he's sold uh, arms now to Saudi Arabia, one of the biggest terrorist uh, states in the world. Uh, so really, I don't see any real change, any significant important change at all so far. I think it's just the same as Bush, the same as Obama, and now it's Trump. It's just a new name. It's a new orange tinge to it, and that's about it. You've talked about how some of Trump's policy ideas are really just, as you said, silly. For example, bu building a wall across the, across the, so uh, the southern border. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a one big one that so many people really want. Uh, it was, uh, we, we have to crack down on, on uh, people uh, selling the Americans cheap products uh, uh, that somehow take away their jobs, which uh, totally doesn't. Uh, it's, you know, that's a crazy. Pe these people don't understand economics at all. Uh, and so tr Trump sort of ran on the thing, well, we're going to build a wall across the entire continent. Uh, and that will stop it. Of course, it wouldn't. All you need to get over a wall is a ladder or under it is a uh, is a shovel. And of course, there's two oceans on either side. So if you have a boat, that's pretty good, too. Uh, so it's totally just uh, silly to even talk about. Uh, but uh, but then he said, oh, I'm going to make Mexico pay for it. And by that, he means he's going to put a tariff on any Mexican products of something like 20 percent or something like that, which all that will do. Mexico is not going to pay for it. That will be U.S. citizens, U.S. customers who pay for it. Anyone who's buying any Mexican 
Mexican products. We'll pay an additional 20 percent and that money will go to the U.S. government. Hey, it's another tax. Uh, and uh, so it, it's absolutely crazy what uh, they're talking about there. It actually will damage the U.S. economy massively if he follows through on any of this stuff because all these protectionist policies will just have the ultimate effect of reducing the demand for the U.S. dollar. Uh, and uh, by doing that, he'll actually uh, crash the dollar dramatically. So he'll, but if he does it, uh, he'll, uh, you know, the, uh, Mexico's two biggest products that they import into uh, the U.S. is food and oil. So if he wants to make food and oil 20 percent more expensive, uh, that'll be interesting. Americans are already paycheck to paycheck. Most of them, most people are just totally just broke in the U.S. now after decades of central bank inflation, massive taxation and regulation that kill all the jobs and industries and everything. Uh, so, you, you know, you're seeing just uh, people... Uh, getting killed by, the, by those tariffs, uh, and then uh, they're going to get killed when the U.S. dollar goes down because of this. The people will have, there'll be less demand for dollars because of it. So then the price of everything else will rise dramatically as well. So we'll see nearly a hyperinflation scenario if Trump follows through with his big plan to help save Americans. All right. Well, Jeff Berwick, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, one last question I was going to ask you is, what do you think the best thing uh, Trump could do? with this broken system? Because you've talked about how the system is really broken. Um, you talked about before how a collapse is inevitable, and Trump can, has two options. He can either keep inflating, or he can default on the debt and let the system crash. What is your perspective on these two? Can you explain these two scenarios and which would be better for the country? Yeah, it's uh, it, it has come down to two uh, scenarios, two options. So these are the only two options available right now to Trump or uh, the U.S. federal government. And uh, it's because of the amount of massive amount of debt. Now, the U.S. has almost 20 trillion dollars worth of debt. That's up nearly 100 percent from 2008 when Barack Obama first uh, uh, became president. So within the span of eight years, the U.S. Uh, national debt has nearly doubled. That's absolute insanity. No one's talking about this. You never heard that talked about when it was Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump in the debates or anything. You never hear it talked about on the news, on the mainstream media, the fake news, CNN. They don't talk about any of this stuff. It's the only question that matters. It's the only important thing. Uh, when you have $20 trillion in debt, and that's not all of it because there's so many liabilities of uh, money that they've already taken in that they're supposed to spend, things like socialist insecurity, things like Medicare, Medicaid. They've just been taking a lot of that money in, and there's been a surplus in the past. There isn't any more, but in the past there was, and they just spent it all. Uh, so that they actually owe that money to the supposedly these systems like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, uh, but they, they have no way of actually paying for it. Uh, the, the U.S. government is bankrupt. Uh, the only way to pay for it is to continue printing money. So. Uh, this is going to end at some point, and the total debt and liabilities is well over $100 trillion now, which if you divide it by 300 and some odd million people in the U.S., that's $250,000 per person of U.S. government debt and liabilities that is overhanging it. So a family of four in the U.S., any typical family of four, just go to Cleveland, Ohio, open the door to a house. If it's a family of four, that's a million dollars worth of U.S. government debt and liabilities overhanging that one house. Uh, this goes for every single house in the U.S. This is a beyond bank bankrupt situation, uh, and th it's going to end soon. This is, cannot go on much longer, and the, the debt just continues to pile up, even under, under Trump. I haven't seen anything to do with actually really reducing debt much uh, at all. In fact, he's talked about increasing the, uh, the amount they want to spend on infrastructure and on the military, because, of course, the U.S. military spending uh, more than the, the next 10 countries after it, their combined military budgets, the U.S. military spends more than that. It's not enough uh, because, of course, if you want to terrorize the entire world, uh, you need more money. You need more than trillions. And, of course, the Pentagon or the Pentagram, as I call it, keeps losing money. They, the la last amount they said they lost was $6 trillion. It's just gone. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's the situation. So the only two si the things that, uh, uh, that the government has a choice on is are they going to continue to print money with the Federal Reserve, with this quantitative easing and interest rates near 0% or even going into negative over the next few years until the U.S. dollar is worthless in the hyperinflation, or are they just going to default on the debt? Uh, that's something Trump actually talked about a little bit uh, before he got elected was how they should renegotiate the debt. Uh, well, any sort of renegotiation is a default and it will have massive, massive repercussions because U.S. debt, Treasury debt is such a big part of the entire world financial system. Now, m most banks, many major companies, they hold a lot of their money, stupidly in my opinion and actually immorally, in U.S. government debt. Uh, so if all of a sudden that debt is worth 30% uh, less or 50% or 100%, which it really should be, 
uh, that will cause a massive, massive depression, unlike anything we've ever seen in the history of the world. Uh, so that's the best case scenario, because if that happened, you'd still have a functioning economy. It'd just be decimated for a period of time, maybe a year or two, it'd just be horrible, uh, absolute worst uh, that anyone's ever seen. Uh, but then it could rebuild. But in a hyperinflation, that actually decimates the entire economy. Nothing can even function unless everyone starts using Bitcoin and silver and gold, which hopefully they will, and hopefully people are smart enough to do that. But if they don't, and the dollar uh, is hyperinflating, just like you see in Venezuela or in Zimbabwe, all of a sudden everything just stops because there's no currency to be used, and so the entire economy goes to essentially to zero. That's actually a worst case scenario, and that would be even worse. Uh, but that looks like the direction in which they're headed. Uh, but we'll see what happens. But either way, it's going to be incredibly bad, and it's going to happen soon. We're not talking decades. We're talking years, and we might even be talking months. Uh, but we're definitely not talking more than uh, uh, you know five years uh, max. I can't even imagine 10, but five years, in my opinion, maximum, uh, before all this system falls apart. And, uh, and that's the best case scenario. So there is no good way out of this. Uh, this has been built now for decades, and uh, we'll see how it all plays out, but it's not going to be good for most people. And for our new viewers who haven't uh, heard our interviews before, what is your perspective on how people can prepare for this crisis? Well, a big part of it is just getting your, if you have assets, and a lot of people don't nowadays, uh, as I mentioned, but if you do, to get a lot of them outside of the financial system. Uh, they've been, uh, you can just see what happens in a place like Greece when they shut down the banks a couple of years ago. A lot of people, as soon as they shut down the banks, they all got in line to take their money out of the bank. It's, that's a little late. You want to do that before they do that. And that's going to, what happened in Greece is going to happen all throughout Europe. It's going to happen in the U.S. It's going to happen in Canada. It's going to happen in Australia. All those countries have bank bail-in clauses now, just like they did in Cyprus uh, when they bailed in the banks and and took 50% uh, of anyone with any large amount of money. They just took 50% of it uh, when they closed the banks. And that's going to happen everywhere. As I mentioned, when this sort of financial collapse happens, all the banks are going to be uh, uh, insolvent. So all the banks will close. So people should just get most of their uh, assets outside of the financial system, get your money outside of the bank. Uh, I don't even care if it's uh, so-called insured by the bankrupt government, and not to mention that the bank insurance company that secures the bank uh, deposits in the U.S. is absolutely beyond bankrupt also on top of the U.S. government being bankrupt. So the whole thing's bankrupt. Uh, so get your assets outside, get into things like precious metals, gold, silver, uh, get into Bitcoin to some extent, not a massive amount perhaps. Uh, uh, it is still new and uh, there is some risks with it, uh, unlike silver and gold, which won't go to zero any time in the near future unless someone learns how to <laughs> make it uh, alch alchemically. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, just get outside, get get some of your assets into hard assets, things like foreign uh, farmland and things like that. I talk about that in our newsletter a little bit. Uh, and uh, just essentially things that uh, the, the U.S. government can't steal and the Federal Reserve can't inflate away. That's what you want to be into. All right. Once again, Jeff Berwick, thank you so much for your time. Did you want to share with the viewers where they can find you online? And I know you have a couple conferences coming up if you'd like to tell our viewers about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, They can find uh, me at the dollarvigilante.com and uh, just look up on YouTube if you're into YouTube, Dollar Vigilante. We do a video almost every day. And yeah, we have a couple conferences coming up this month. On February 24th, we have the Dollar Vigilante Internationalization and Investment Summit uh, uh, in Acapulco, Mexico. We have so many great speakers. I'll be there and our senior analyst of the Dollar Vigilante, Ed Bugos. Uh, then we have a number of uh, excellent speakers, so I'm sure you're aware of many of them, including Bill Murphy of the GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. He'll be one of the speakers. David Morgan, probably the, one of the top sort of silver analysts, in my opinion, in the world, uh, will be there. Bix Weir of Road Deruto, really interesting uh, guy with interesting theories on uh, how this whole um, fallout's going to take place. Uh, and uh, Colin Cattell of Palisade Capital, a really uh, amazing young uh, guy who's uh, doing amazing investment stuff in the mining markets uh, and all kinds of other people. So check that out at tdvinvestmentsummit.com. And then after that, the day after, we have a four-day voluntarist or slash anarcho-capitalist conference called the Narcopoco uh, with all the top sort of freedom people from across the world will be there. Uh, and that's four straight days. So five days total of, of events all in Acapulco at the end of this month. Once again, Jeff Berwick, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. The world is going to be dramatically different in just a few short years. The European Union is fracturing, beginning with Brexit. Donald Trump is ushering in a new era of populism and protectionism. Government debt is wildly out of control. Numerous central banks have gone to negative interest rates in order to keep the system going just a little while longer. Capital controls are increasing, 
while the war on cash has been pursued with fervor in places like India and Venezuela. The World Bank, IMF, Bank of Canada, George Soros, Jacob Rothschild, and many more have warned that we are in uncharted waters and on the edge of collapse. Putting your money in a mutual fund and holding it for 30 years will not work anymore. Jeff Berwick has been warning of this since founding the Dollar Vigilante with Ed Bugos in 2010, and his calls have been epic. He was the first prominent financial commentator to tell his subscribers and the public to get into Bitcoin when it was $3 in 2011. It's currently $800. What's your connection to Bitcoin? Uh, my main connection is I'm incredibly excited about it. Bitcoin is a revolution in money and banking, the same way that the Internet was a revolution in communication. Wait, what, what? Ed Bugos has been one of the few to warn of the 2001 and 2008 crashes and has been bullish on gold since its bottom in the year 2000. And together, they are holding their annual TDV Investment and Internationalization Summit this February in Acapulco, Mexico, to help you prepare for the crisis ahead. Last year at the TDV Summit, they warned of what was coming and gave advice that made attendees fortunes. This is why we're at where we're at, central banking. Give a man a gun and he can rob a bank. Give a man a bank and he can rob everyone. And, you know, we, we all grew up watching old westerns and people would rob banks. Now it's the good old days. So now banks rob you. Ed Bugos mentioned three stocks to buy. Agnico Eagle. Uh, Agnico Eagle is won by one of the most experienced management teams in the industry and it rose 76.31% since. B2 Gold Corp. B2 Gold Corp is responsible for discovering more than 30 million ounces of gold in their careers. And it rose 248%. And Sabina Gold and Silver Corp. Sabina is an emerging producer. It then rose 147%. These are terrific calls, and this year you can expect more of them. Jeff Berwick and Ed Bugos will be surrounded with an all-star lineup of speakers, including author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin, who will discuss the state of central banking today. The world's most respected silver analyst, David Morgan of The Morgan Report. Bix Ware of RoadToRuta.com on discovery of the truth behind our massively manipulated markets and to help expose those who threaten our free market system. Chairman of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, Gatter, Bill Murphy, continues to expose the manipulation of the gold price by the gold cartel. Returning speaker Roger Baer, the Bitcoin Jesus, who recommended buying Bitcoin at last year's conference when it was below $400. It has since risen to over $1,000. Other speakers include Chris Casey of Windrock Wealth Management and Colin Cattell of Palisade Global and many more. The TDV Internationalization and Investment Summit will be an all-day and evening event on February 24th, held in the five-star Mundo Imperial Resort and Convention Center in Acapulco, Mexico. For the price of $395, you will spend an entire day with these experts, including an entire evening gala banquet with all food and drinks included. You can find more at tdvinvestmentsummit.com and register today because space is limited. And 